to read, I have a number of scriptures to read this evening. Um, most of them are in the New Testament, but I'd like to read two from the Old Testament to begin, um, and then I'll explain what it is that I have before me. Um, we could turn, please, to the first book of Samuel, chapter 18, and verses 6 to 8. <clears throat> and it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul, with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played, and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what more can he have but kingdom? And the second scripture is in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verses 38 to 40. 1 Chronicles 12, 38 to 40. All these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to heaven to make David king over all Israel, and all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. And there they were with David three days, eating and drinking, for those brethren had for their brethren had prepared for them. Moreover, they that were nigh them, even unto Issachar, with David three days, eating and drinking, for his brethren had, for their brethren had prepared for them. Moreover, they that were nigh them, even unto Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali, were brought bread on on mules and on oxen and meat, meal, cakes, cakes of figs and bunches of raisins and wine and oil and oxen and sheep abundantly, for there was joy in Israel. My subject this evening is joy in our gatherings. Now, you do need to turn to the New Testament for that, and we will do so in a moment. But as I began to think about the subject, this phrase came before me very strongly. There was joy in Israel. And there was a, a reason for that joy. And this is what I want to bring out before we um, go into um, present day conditions for our gatherings. You probably know that the account in Samuel and Kings and the account in Chronicles are different. Samuel and Kings take us through step by step historically what happened. David was not always perfect. We see him in his struggles, in his opposition from Saul. We see him winning battles, losing battles, we see a variety of circumstances. At one point, 1 Samuel chapter 30, he nearly lost everything, and I mean everything, but God encouraged him and he recovered all. It's not like that in the story in Chronicles, it's very different. It's not that one is true and one is not. They're both true. But looking at the, what happened from different ways. 
in Chronicles, we have the purposes of God fulfilled in the king after his own heart. And the ascension of David to the throne in Chronicles begins at the beginning of chapter 11, where it says, All Israel gathered together with one accord to make David king. It was true. And chapter 12 traces how they came to him. And Ziklag from the hold from Hebron, and how they had one purpose before. Now, I read that verse in 1 Samuel 18, because I believe it's the first mention of joy in the Bible. If it's not, please tell me afterwards. But as far as I can find out, it, it is the first specific mention of joy. We all know that the first mention of any particular word, any particular <laughs> thought is to be taken as the keynote for the rest. And what is the cause of joy in 1 Samuel 18 and those verses we read? It was David's victory over Goliath. He had won the victory over the enemy of Israel and the enemy of God. And our joy surely starts with the victory of the Lord Jesus at Calvary, where he won the victory over the one who had the power of death, whereby he could set free all those who were subject to bondage. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then your joy begins when you reflect on what the Lord Jesus did for you at Calvary. And each one of us can relate to this. And it's important that we do. If we're going to talk about joy in our gatherings, it's no good me talking to you about that unless I have joy in my own heart for the same reasons. And you have to have joy in your heart. We can hardly expect there to be joy in our gatherings if individually we don't know that joy if it's not a regular experience for us, or if it's not something we've entered into. In 1 Samuel 18, there is great joy. The enemy of Israel, the enemy of God had been defeated. Goliath had been put an end to in chapter 17. Goliath was finished. And at the cross, the enemy of God's people, the accuser of the brethren, was defeated once for all. And that must be a cause of joy to everyone who knows that freedom that the Lord Jesus Christ alone can give. Freedom from the burden of the penalty of our sins, freedom from the law, freedom from self. In 1 Chronicles 12, we have the account of all Israel coming together. And I had originally intended to, to take this as my subject, but I'm not going to, for a reason which I'll explain shortly. But in this chapter, we see a common cause of coming together. It is service to David because he is their king. He's the leader among them. And we see that each of them brings some particular, each of the tribes, brings some particular contribution as they come together. We see Benjamin coming first of all. Benjamin comes first. And he is serving David, not serving Saul, as might have been more natural for him, bearing in mind that Saul was the son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin. But no, Bert Benjamin in this chapter comes to David. We see Gad separating themselves to David 
We see them crossing the Jordan in its time of flood. The natural barrier is no barrier to them in their desire to be with David and support him. The, the Jordan didn't part for them. It's as, I suppose, in a sense, it was already parted because it parted for the children of Israel originally when they crossed it to take possession um, of their land of promise. So the natural barrier didn't, wouldn't hold Gad back. Uh, we see that Gad separated themselves. They crossed the Jordan. Benjamin and Judah, that wonderful exclamation when they were challenged, um, when David said to them, if you become to betray me to mine enemies, seeing there is no wrong in mine hands, the God of our fathers look thereon and rebuke it. The spirit came upon Amasai, who was chief of the captains, and he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse, peace, peace be unto thee, and peace be to thine helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them and made them captains of the band. Lower down, we find Issachar. Issachar had understanding of the times. And how valuable this is. Zebulun could keep rank. Can I keep rank? Can you keep rank? You see, there are people who follow their own, what they see as their own mission, and perhaps don't care much for their brethren how important it is to keep rank. These are things that come up in any company of believing people. They're as relevant today as they were in the time of David the king. And in verse 38, they all could keep rank. And we see in verses 38 to 40, we see them coming together. Yes, they were eating and drinking, but that was not, it wasn't just a picnic, it wasn't just a good time. It was because they were gathered around David, because he was the center. And that was the source of their joy. Giving them uh, expression to the fellowship which they had as they supported David. Now, this I suggest is a basis for what we're going to look at now in the New Testament. Um, the theme really came to me when I listened last um, month to our brother Lloyd Legister, who took up the theme of gathering together unto him, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he took two scriptures, one in two Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 which speaks of our gathering together unto him at the time when he comes to take us to be with himself and the other was Hebrews 10 25 which speaks of not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together speaking of our assembling together now and he made the point that when we come together in our meetings now it should be like it should be a foretaste of what it will be like when we gather with our lord jesus and he carries us up to the father's house what a wonderful thing and surely that will fill our hearts with joy and therefore when we come together now should not something of that joy be present as we do so Let's look at some New Testament scriptures. Um, I have, I think, six in all. I'll take two together to begin with. Um, John 15. I'm going to, John, it's Gospel chapter 15. I'm not going to read verses 9 to 11. <laughs> Uh, 
as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. <coughs> These things have I spoken unto you, that your joy might be that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And in John 16, uh, I'm going to read verses 16 to 24. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. Because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. They said therefore, What is this that he said? A little while. We cannot tell what he said. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, that the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned unto joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour has come, that as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy as a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. From you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing, <coughs> Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. And the verses we read in chapter 15 speak of full, uh, fullness of joy, in abiding in Christ. This chapter is really about abiding. I know you'll tell me it's about fruit bearing, but the fruit bearing is a consequence of the abiding. That is the message of this chapter. And as a result, there will be fruit. Uh, fruit, more fruit, much fruit. But the secret is abiding, and in that abiding in the Lord Jesus, it means occupation with him, but it also means in these verses, obedience to him. Keeping my word. If you keep my commandments. What are the Lord's commandments? Well, we read them in the scriptures. They are remarkably few. And this is the secret of joy. It is a joy of obedience in everyday things. It's the joy of living one's life according to the words that the Lord Jesus has taught us in these chapters. That is what it is. And in all this, as in everything, the Lord is our example. If we think of Psalm 26, now I know we read Psalm 26, well, sorry, Psalm 23. I know we often, we read Psalm 23 and we rightly speak of the Lord Jesus as being our shepherd. But have you ever read that Psalm and taken it as the Psalm, the utterance of the Lord Jesus in his experience when he went through this world? Jehovah is my shepherd.
This was his daily experience. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness, for his name is sake. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to, do, and to finish his work. I do always those things that please the Father. And so it goes on. <coughs> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the pathway of the Lord Jesus through this world was a pathway of the valley of the shadow of death. Reading John's Gospel, how often the Pharisees the opposition came to take him, and it was not allowed. His hour had not yet come, but it was the valley of the shadow of death for the Lord Jesus throughout his life. And of course, he, he met that death in reality at Calvary. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Read that psalm again and again and think of the experience of the Lord Jesus in this world, and it will serve as a pattern for us. His joy to do the Father's will, the joy of obedience in everyday things, free from the law, free from sin, free from self. And in the Psalm in John chapter 16, we find another fullness of joy. The Lord Jesus here is speaking to his own. And when he speaks of um, uh, seeing him again, I, I think that has a double meaning. It, it has the immediate meaning that they would see him again when he had risen from the dead. That is one meaning. The other meaning is that they will see him again. You and I will see him again when he comes to take us to be with himself. So we can have the joy in the fact that he rose again from the dead. This is what was the immediate joy before his disciples in this chapter. The fact that he, they would see him again. And in, a, in chapter 20, as we know, it says, Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. There's a double meaning here. And we shall be glad when we see the Lord. But the very prospect of that now, surely is a joy to our hearts. And surely we can read these verses with understanding and appreciation of the fact that one day we shall see him face to face. And that is uh, an anticipation uh, now. Uh, there, are, there, there is a joy in his resurrection for us as we think on the fact that he rose again from among the dead. The joy that these disciples had is our joy, but in a different way. We haven't seen him, but we know that he was delivered for our offences, raised again for our justification, Romans 4.25. That's one source of joy for us. Another is the fact that we will see him again. And the third is mentioned in these verses that we read, the joy of asking in his name. Now this is something that comes out very strongly in these chapters. But we can ask the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he hears us. This is repeated, of course, in John's epistle. We know that he hears us. What a blessing this is. What a source of joy. Now, the Lord Jesus is not our King, but He is our Lord. And therefore, I'm going to apply what we uh, read in, um, in uh, 1 Chronicles 12. I think we can apply that to ourselves with the same um, 
uh, the, the same effect as the Israelites uh, gathering around David, their king. So we now gather around Jesus Christ, our Lord. But there is still a kingdom. And I'm going now to turn to Romans 14. Um. Verse. Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God. Are we clear what that is? It's not the same thing as the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is in mystery now. Uh, one day it's going to be in display when the Lord Jesus reigns. The kingdom of heaven is that place where the name of the Lord Jesus is taken and held. But the kingdom of, and it, it, it's, it has to do with dispensations. The kingdom of heaven in mystery now, in display, when the Lord reigns. The kingdom of God is nothing to do with dispensations. What is the kingdom of God then? Well, I've heard it described as the sway of God in the heart of a man. It, it, it is the kingdom of God. It's that place where God has its place. It's that place where God has its place. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ said, the kingdom of heaven is within that is um, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter, I think we better read it. Luke 17, verses 20 to 21. Luke 17. Verses 20 to 21. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. In other words, these people were looking for the kingdom. It's not something dispensational, it's not a change of kingship down here. The Lord says, the kingdom of God is within you. If God has his place in your heart, then that is the manifestation of the kingdom of God. That is why the Apostle Paul, later, the Apostle Paul preached the kingdom of God. You know what I'm referring to in Acts chapter 20, and it is farewell address to the elders of Ephesus. He speaks of three things that, that he preached. The first one is the gospel of the grace of God. That's what meets us at the beginning. The gospel of the grace of God. The second one is the kingdom of God. And the third thing he preached was all the counsel of God. And that's all God's counsels concerning assembly, I think it was the assembly he had in mind, that God's counsels. Now the kingdom of God is what comes in between. Having believed the gospel of the grace of God, we now have to realize that there is a kingdom of God, that there is, God has a place within our hearts. And we have to learn what that place is. And here, in Romans 14, 17, we learn what it is. He's just said that it's not meat and drink. It's not a question of 
fancy diets, veganism, something like that. Everything that God has provided is fit to eat and drink if we give thanks for it. But what it is, is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is the effect of God in the hearts of men and women. The kingdom of God is righteousness. Everything to do with God starts with righteousness. God is righteous and he will have us righteous. <clears throat> and he has given the Lord Jesus Christ the one who knew no sin, he's made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 We are made the righteousness of God in him. That righteousness should be dis in display in the way that we live. This is what Paul is writing here. To the, epistle, to the church in Rome. Righteousness and peace, we'll come to that later, and joy in the Holy Ghost. There must be peace if there's going to be joy in our assemblies. There must be peace. Have you ever wondered why that um, uh, in, in, in Thessalonians, um, the first epistle, chapter 5, towards the end of the chapter, he writes, Be at peace among yourselves. Now, why did he need to write that to Thessalonians? That was almost a model assembly. They're all young Christians, they're all going on so well. There's not a, a word of criticism. So, why did he write, Be at peace among yourselves? Well, I suppose he knew what men and women are by nature. And that needs to be taken account of. So he, he writes it, and I'm so thankful he did. And if there's one thing that we, we need to concentrate on, it is peace among ourselves. Might not sound very ambitious, but it's needful. It's a necessary stepping stone from that righteousness that we ought to individually and together be displayed to the joy which is the third in this in this verse righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit and this is what god desires us to have in our assemblies and for that to be we must know something of it individually surely the kingdom of God. Submission to the Holy Spirit. It is, if the verse finishes, through the Holy Spirit. If we submit to the Spirit's leading, won't we know more of these things? Won't we allow the Holy Spirit to bring peace? And that will then allow joy. Now there's joy. What of it? What is it? Where does it rest? Let's turn to 1 John 1. Um, it's verse 4. But I'm going to read the, all the first four verses of 1 John 1. That which we was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. That which we have seen and heard, the apostle is writing here of one who he had seen and heard, had company with the Lord Jesus Christ. He laid in his bosom. And in his, his gospel, he marks the transition from that to what we have now, which is faith. You and I have not actually physically seen the Lord Jesus. John 14, 1, believe in God, believe also in me. And that's where you and I come in now. We can't echo the words of John here but in his epistle, but he's telling us so that we know that he has physically been intimate, closely linked with that blessed one who walked here below. He's seen for himself, and now he's telling us what fellowship really is. And this is something that we can all enter into because it is a present possession. It's something which God has given to us. And how wonderful it is. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Can we imagine anything more precious, anything more blessed than that? When we think of what the Father has brought us, what the Father and the Son have brought us into. You know, there's one of our hymns, it's 189, the third and fourth line go, we stand accepted in the place that none but Christ could claim. Have you ever thought of that? We stand accepted in the place that none but Christ could claim. What blessings indeed. I think we touch on it when we um, uh, read 1 Corinthians 10, truly, uh, uh, the cup of thanksgiving for which we bless. That brings us, that reminds us of this wonderful fellowship that we're brought into, whereby we share things that rightly belong to the Father and the Son, but as objects of their grace and love, we're brought in to share them and to know something of the Father's thoughts of the Son and to know something of the Son's love and delight to do the Father's will and something of that sphere of blessing into which they bring us now and will bring us into for eternity. What wonderful blessing! Uh, the Father and the Son. We realize it in communion when we break bread. We realize it in communion when we break bread, but it is actually a reality all the time. It is not something that we share once a week. It is a reality all the time. We are in blessed communion with the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit. We therefore, when we come back to Philippians, that's the scriptures there, Philippians chapter 2. Verse 2, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. The Apostle here is speaking, at, uh, 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 exalting them to be like-minded. Verse 4, not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. <laughs> Who 
This is an exhortation to every one of us, I feel, that we need to cultivate that like-mindedness to the Lord Jesus. And then we will be like-minded one to another. Doesn't mean we'll think precisely the same thoughts or be carbon copies one of another. That's not the thought at all. What it means is that we will have that same purpose in life, which we see displayed in the Lord Jesus. And therefore, we will be able. You indeed is not grievous. These things that we have in common. But this is the responsibility. And in Philippians 4, verse 4, this chapter really is full of joy and rejoicing. Chapter 3, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write these things unto you indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. The Lord Jesus is our joy, and he is that joy for eternity. He is our joy now on earth, he will be our joy in heaven above. This is true for each of us, and for the gathered company, whether we're <coughs> here now or whether we're gathered in the Father's house, what a wonderful theme of joy we have. How it is something that the world knows nothing of. But we should treasure these things and promote them when we come together that we might be remembered, that we might remember that wonderful sphere of blessing into which we've been brought through no merit of our own, but it is the Father's good pleasure. <coughs> I wonder if we could sing a few verses in a hymn finish. Um, Four hundred and twenty two, starting at verse three. The fellowship with me, the Father, and with Jesus Christ, my Son. Such so I know most gracious giving by thy spirit to each one. Same verses three, four, five, and six, four hundred and twenty two.